I love the fact that we can have days that we celebrate together and not only just celebrate together, but look at how God has moved us and intertwined people into our paths and how we have been able to, as a church, come behind uh, the families that we just saw in front of us as well as families and kids across this world. About 12 years ago, uh, God brought a person into our life as a church named Peter Abungu. And we have, over those last years, partnered with him on trips and retreats. A lot of you have sponsored children or girls in the ministry that Peter runs called Swahiba. And this morning, we wanted to have Peter with us, but things didn't work out this morning. So we have the second best thing that we can do. And we are going to spend a couple of minutes hanging out with Peter this morning via video. So Peter Abungu, welcome to church this morning. Would you guys say hello to Peter this morning. Here he is. Hello, church. Here he is. That smile, Peter. We love it. Uh, We love it. Well, Peter, I know we have a lot of new people in the house uh, and as part of this church. Spend just a minute and give everyone a little bit of a who you are, what do you do, and, and what are we talking about this morning? Well, um, it's a great privilege to join you via this medium. About about close to 19 plus years ago, God led me into the heart of one of the largest slums in Africa called Kibera. Uh, We have about a million people living in four miles radius with uh, limited plumbing roads, no electricity, and in very uh, uh, hard uh, situation. Uh, so over the last 19 years, we, are, we have labored there. The Lord has uh, been faithful. We have seen uh, over 20,000 young people surrender their lives to the Lord. And um, we have been able to uh, witness to a, a great number uh, who have graduated high school, gone on, and some of them are starting uh, to come back into the community and actually transforming lives in Kibera. And so... Um, uh, we've we've walked this journey with you, and about 12 years ago, you locked arms with us as a as a as a, a family, and started really bringing teams to work with us in the slums, in the community, and uh, the pastoral team of Bantry Creek. So they need to train pastors and and engage with them so that they can correctly divide the word of truth, and it's it's been uh, an organic um, God thing that has happened that has allowed us to go far beyond what we had even imagined. Well, Peter, six months ago, uh, you were with us, I think it was in May, um, and this church came behind you and had a, had a vision to plant a church in the slums as well as a resource center to be able to launch you to impact even more girls and people in the slums uh, that you're working in. What's been happening over those last six months, Peter? Where are we in the process? What's things looking like? Just bring us a little update. So, uh, <laughs> so back in May, we... Uh, you know, you, you as a church have blessed us beyond our wildest dreams uh, with a gift to allow us to buy land and to build. And uh, so when I came back, we started on the journey of a gracefully, uh, very, uh, very actively looking for a piece of land. And we looked for several uh, pieces of land. Some of them had issues. And um, just about a month and a half ago, we had a breakthrough with two pieces of, of properties that are just into um uh, next to each other that has allowed us um, that will allow us to actually realize our dream and um, and this coming week uh, because funds have been sent to us and this coming week we'll be signing and um, and acquiring titles towards um, now getting ready to, <laughs> to start the process of building. Peter, what are we building? What's it going to look like? Give us a little glimpse into what this resource center that is going to literally transform what you're able to do. What does it look like? It's, man, it's, it's phenomenal. It's, it's such a great blessing. Um, for those of you who have come to serve with us, you know the kind of space we do have. Um, uh, but this is going to allow us, it's going to be a, a, a building with multiple floors. It will have an underground that will allow us to have parking. Then on the ground floor, we will have offices. Uh, we will have meeting rooms. We'll have a kitchen, um, full kitchen. There'll be a reception area. There'll be, we'll have a lot of uh, washroom facilities 
those who have come and served with us, we only have one. It serves both boys and girls and everybody on the team. Um, so this is going to be such a great blessing. And then on the first floor, it will be an auditorium. It will be a, a facility that can host between four to 500 people. And, uh, you know, in Africa, we have a very, very little uh, sense of personal space. So we will be able to fit a lot more people there. Uh, so uh, uh, we'll be able to plant the church. We'll be able to continue have conferences of purity program and, uh, and the mentorship programs and fast party club uh, trainings. Uh, and the pastor's training and be able to plant a church in that facility. On the second floor, we will have um, an hotel setting, uh, rooms that will allow us to host teams so that we can uh, effectively and cheaply host teams that come to serve with us and, um, and allow them to um, even stay longer. If people are able to pay a little bit less, people can stay longer and serve uh, with us uh, in this community. So it's super exciting. Uh, to see what God is, is, is about to do, and we're just so humbled. Peter, what is, this gonna, what is this building going to do? Obviously, we rallied behind. The church here gave um, incredibly uh, gifted the ministry there at Swahibo and our partnership with, with a half a million, a little over a half a million dollars uh, in this. Correct. What is this facility going to do? Well, this facility will, will enable us to do ministry um, in a far much greater capacity than we have been able to do before. Uh, what we have right now, we are renting. And every time we have an event, even when we've hosted teams uh, from Bantikri, we've had to rent a facility just to do a children's, uh, a children's Bible club or our pastor's training. And uh, that has been, uh, been very limiting because sometimes the facility is not even available. So right now we will have our own space where we can plan and not, not, not uh, be disappointed, and um, and use it for multiple, multiple ministry opportunities. Uh, the pastors training, the uh, the church plant, the, all the purity programs, and the mentorship and empowerment, the fast party clubs, and this facility will also use it. I mean, the hall when it's available for other people to rent, they'll be able to rent. And and far and above when we when it's when we. When the ministry has been built, we'll have a big sign on it that declares it as a ministry center where people can come and uh, be prayed with, receive ministry, and it just it will transform how we've been able to uh, engage even with the community in the past. Peter, real quick, what are we looking at on timeline? I know that's what all the questions that I get is. What are we thinking? Okay, so uh, so we 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 live in a in a place where timelines don't necessarily work, <laughs> but we, <laughs> we, uh, we, we are, my prayer is that we will be able to break ground by February and, um, and, and, uh, and officially launch. Uh, I mean, start the building process in February and then have it ready by September because on the 20th of September, 2022, it will be 20 years since I landed in Kibera. And uh, it will be my desire and my prayer to, to uh, officially open the building, uh, unveil the building, and celebrate what God has done over the last 20 years. We are hoping that in February we'll be able to have a couple of you guys come and celebrate this break, groundbreaking ceremony with us and just, um, and just bless the Lord for what he's been able to do. Amen. Well, Peter, I'm not sure how many people you can see, but you've got a whole bunch of people right here with you. What's two really fast things that they can be praying for you over these next months? No. Number one, uh, could you kindly pray for the event we have in the next month? We will be distributing over uh, 3,000 pairs of shoes, two pairs of socks for each of the children. And uh, we will also be giving them a snack meal. And above all, as we give them shoes, we'll be sharing the gospel with them. Could you pray that the Lord will... Uh, will prepare their hearts that as we interact with them that the light the entrance to the word of god will bring light and that they will make jesus lord and savior over their lives the second thing is um could you kindly pray for the filing of the building plans so that we can have the permissions um because that sounds like a very simple thing here it is super complicated pray that the lord will give us favor and grace that as we um 
as once we have titled this this week, as we sign and, and get the titles, we will now start the process of applying for uh, building uh, permissions and all the necessary documentations for us to start building. So pray that that will go smoothly and that we'll enjoy the favor of the Lord. Amen. Would you guys do me a favor? He might not be able to see you, but he can hear you. Will you just express how thankful we are uh, to Peter and his ministry in Swahiba in Kenya? Bless you, Peter. We will talk soon. Go to bed. I know it's been a long day. All right. In the year 2000, I was freshly out of college. Uh, I got invited to go on a speaking team uh, that went to the country of Romania that had just not too long before that come out of, uh, come out of communism, if you remember that time period. Wasn't a whole lot of churches around. They were just beginning to rebirth themselves and grow. A whole generation had been lost uh, from not being able to worship during communism. And part of this team, what we did as our responsibility was we visited every single church that had been identified to encourage them, to preach in them, to offer the gospel, and to encourage people to give their lives to the Lord. I loved it because every single day we were in eight to ten different churches scheduled in and out and in and out preaching in these churches. So all day long, there was a team of about four or five of us that that's what we did all day long. It was the life, it was a dream life for a preacher just to be able to go and preach. Well, one particular Sunday, we went outside of town super early that morning. We drove, we preached in one church. On our way to the second church, they kept telling us that we were going to be late to the services that we were going into. Well, if you've ever been in another country where time really doesn't matter, aka with Peter, you'll know that you can go for days in worship. So we walked into this worship service that had been started for about 25 minutes already, and they looked at me because I was next up and said this one word, preach. That's all they said. And it was like, well, all right. So I threw my bag down. I walked up to the front. And I mean, I went at it. I mean, I went for it as all that I had in me. My little Romanian lady translator beside me was just ripping. I think she was basically saying whatever she wanted to because they were laughing when there was nothing that was funny. And they weren't laughing when I thought I was funny. But that didn't matter. For about 30 or 45 minutes, I mean, I went at it hard, as hard as I could. I got finished, gave a time of response, an altar call, and some people left their seats. They began to respond to the gospel during that worship time. We had a response time of about five or ten minutes, and after that response time was over, I was thinking, okay, well, that was great. It's on to the next church. Little did I know that's not how it operated in this church. They looked at me after that response time and said that same word to me again, preach. And I was like, well, Okay. I mean, I thought, well, maybe they just wanted me to wrap it up again or give a little devotional moment to close this out. They said, oh, no, 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 do it again. Do it again. And so I said, well, okay, flip to another passage in the Bible, open it up, and for another 30 or 45 minutes, went at it again with everything I had. Got to the end, we did it again. We gave the response time. A couple people responded and got saved. Well, in this one, I walked over to the side, grabbed a sip of water, and I'm sitting there ready to go again, right? I'm thinking, well, it might happen again. Well, we closed the service out, and it was lunchtime, and we ended up eating with the leadership of this church. Now, when I say church, I mean like a little tin shack with about 100 people in it. Most of them, about 75 of them, were probably 70 years of age and above, and 25 of them were little kids. We went into lunch that day into this little back courtyard, and I looked up, and there was two little structures in the back that looked like little bunk houses, and there was one little structure that had a sign over the door in Cyrillic and in Romanian, and, and it said the word school over the door. And so I started asking the church leadership, there was about four of them that stayed with us, what was happening, and they said, oh, oh, oh those are our kids. And I looked up and noticed that the 25 kids that were at church that morning were having lunch with us, which caused a lot more questions in my mind. And it came to be that this little church of 75, 70 year old and above people had adopted these 25 kids as their own. They fed them, they schooled them, they educated them, they led them in the Lord. And there was this gap of a generation in the middle of them that should have been their parents that were nowhere to be found. That day in a small little town of Romania, God did something in me that changed me. 
He showed me what it looked like to be a church that follows the heart of God. Number one, you can preach as long as you want. That was incredible. But number two, this church cared for kids. And not just kids, this church cared for the vulnerable kids of the world. Look, I grew up in church. I'd heard thousands of messages. I knew every kid's song that was out there. But until that point in my life, I never saw what Jesus meant when he said, let the little ones come unto me. In fact, if you have a copy of scripture this morning, I want you to turn with me to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10. And I want you to see this morning what God showed me in that place. And I coveted before the Lord that day and said, God, if you ever allow me to be part of leading a church, it's going to look like this one right here. Mark chapter 10, if you know the story, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. He is doing miracles. He's feeding people. He's teaching in parables. There's a large crowd that is around him, and he stops in his tracks right here, and he begins to teach his disciples an incredibly big lesson. In fact, he rebukes his disciples. Some of my favorite parts of the whole Bible is when Jesus rebukes his disciples, because every time Jesus rebukes the disciples, he's really rebuking me. And he's really rebuking you. And he teaches them this little lesson in Mark chapter 10 that goes along with the theme of our day. Look at it. Mark 10 verse 13 says this. It says people were bringing their little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them. But the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. That's just a fancy word that meant he was mad. He said to them, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them. For the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly I tell you, Jesus says, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms. He placed his hands on them and he blessed them. Did you catch the rebuke? Did you catch the lesson? Did you catch the moment, this incredibly short four-verse four significant moment in the disciples' life where Jesus shows them two principles that we need to grab a hold of? And the first principle is this. It's that kids have an incredible faith that we should mimic. Kids have an incredible faith. What does that mean? That means that kids have this inept ability, this built-in ability to 100% sell out to something. Those of you who are kids, you know what I'm talking about, right? It doesn't matter if it's G.I. Joe or the Wiggles when they're growing up. It doesn't matter if it was that song at VBS that you are tired of hearing. It doesn't matter if it's a sport or it's a person that they have latched on to. Kids, they have this amazing ability to put their mind on something, whether it's ice cream or a particular food, and nothing else matters to them. They don't care what anybody thinks. They don't care what anybody says. They don't care how anybody else is directing them. They get their mind set on something and come hell or high water, they will chase after it. Amen? You know what I'm talking about. You everybody, remember teaching your kid how to swim if you have one? You remember you started, after they learned a little bit of how to swim, you put them on the side of the pool and you'd let them jump and they would jump right into your arms. You'd let them jump, they'd jump right into your arms. And remember that day you were in the shallow end of the pool and all of a sudden you heard the splash in the other end of the pool? What did they think? They thought you would catch them. They thought, why? Because they were 100% in a faith moment that you had them. Any of you with bigger brothers and bigger sisters? you would do anything they told you to do. Anything, no matter how dangerous it is, why? Because you trusted them. And I got to thinking about kids this week and, and I thought about this one. They don't even care what people think about them. Some of this is evident in the fact that your kid didn't even wear shoes to church this morning. <laughs> Kids don't care what they look like. They don't care what their hair looks like. They don't care if they still have on their pajama bottoms when you get to school. They don't care. That's what Jesus is saying right here when he says in verse 14, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. 
It means they get to this place in their life where there is no short-sighted reason. There is no counting the cost. There's this idea of, yes, Lord, no matter what else happens, I'm running after you. Kids have an incredible faith that we should mimic. My question to all of us is this. Do you see your heavenly father through a childlike faith? Or do you see it through a guarded faith that culture has put blinders over your eyes? The second principle that Jesus teaches them is this one right here. It's that, it's that God has a special place in his heart for kids. He has a special place in his heart for kids, especially vulnerable kids, especially Jesus just showed us this, right? Verse 14, watch what he says. I mean, ministry is happening. People are being fed. Miracles are happening. There's a huge crowd around him. I'm sure the disciples had him on a schedule that he was supposed to be keeping. There was things that needed to be done that day. But verse 14, what did Jesus say? Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them. For the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. We find this heart all over scripture. Deuteronomy 10 verse 18 says that God or he defends the cause of the fatherless. Psalm 68 says that a father to the fatherless, a defender of the widows, is God in his holy dwelling. And God sets the lonely into families. Isaiah 117 says, learn to do what is right and seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless. And listen to me, this goes farther than just the, the it's the moral thing to do, right? It's, it, this goes farther than it's just the right thing to do to take care of kids. God desires us in a pure religion mindset to chase after the kids and the hurting and the vulnerable of our world. In fact, isn't this exactly what James, the brother of Jesus, said? You see, James boils everything that we do as a believer in Christ into what he calls pure and faultless religion. And interestingly enough, James doesn't describe pure and faultless religion as discipleship or doctrine, although those things are important, right? Those things are bedrocks of our faith. Those things matter, and you know us well enough to know that we are a discipling group here in this church, that doctrine matters to us. Interestingly enough, James doesn't describe pure and faultless religion as just worshiping or coming to church or just giving, although those things matter. Those are big parts of who we are in Christ and how we walk out our faith. What James says is pure religion. Watch this. James 127 says religion that our father accepts as pure and faultless is this. Look after the orphans and the widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. James breaks down all of religion, right? All of our following after who God is into two categories. Number one, he says that pure religion seeks private purity. Pure religion. If you wanna know that you're living God's plan for your life, the number one thing in any believer's life should be that we are chasing after holiness. They were chasing after purity. They were chasing after the heart of God. Look at James 1, 27, verse B, or the second part. Watch what it says. He says, pure religion is keeping oneself from being polluted by the world. Now, notice that word, oneself, because here's what I know about me, and here's what I know about a lot of us. We are really good at pointing out the unholiness of others. Really good. In fact, for some of us, it's a hobby or a spiritual gift. We're really good at it. But what James says is the number one thing in our life needs to be that we are pursuing holiness. Pursuing the holiness and the righteousness of God. Pursuing the tracks that God has us on that is leading us to his very heart. Now what does that mean? That means that our question in life is not, is that a sin or is that not a sin? That is a horrible question. Or how far is too far? Or how many is too many? Or can I have that many and not this many? That's a terrible question. The question is this, is that holy? Is it holy? And if the answer is no, then run away from it. Purity privately in our life is where God is pointing us. 
Are we seeking the heartbeat of Jesus to a point to where his holiness is beginning to saturate our lives and we notice our path beginning to skew exactly towards who God is? That's pure religion. That is the bedrock religion and nothing can supersede that in our lives because everything else in our lives boils down to am I seeking the purity of God? The rest of it happens because of that. But number two says this, pure religion displays public charity. And I want you to write down beside that, compassion. Pure religion, after holiness, displays public charity and compassion, especially to those who are vulnerable. That's what we're seeing in the text today. In fact, look at James 1.27 again. It says religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless. You can't find anything wrong with it. That's what it means. Is to look after the orphans and the widows in their distress. Now let me deal with the widows just for a minute because that's not the theme of our morning, but I just don't want you to think we're throwing them out, right? Man, this church has an incredible ministry to the widows through our deacon ministry. And I just want you to know that that is what they do and they love on them. In fact, at least three or four times over this course year, over the course of this last year, I've called one of our widows that had something going on in their life and their deacon had already taken care of it. So just want you to know that. But this morning's theme, I want you to look at it, is this, pure and faultless, is to look after the orphans. Now, what does that mean? I love this language to look after because it means way more than looking at. Can I tell you, we're really good at looking at the orphans. But here's my question. Are we looking after them? Are we looking after them? Because here's the deal. Here's the principle. Write it down just to clear it up. Rescuing hurting kids is not just a charity for us to support. It's a rescue mission for the whole church. It's a rescue mission. Now notice what Jesus is saying as part of this principle. Part of this principle is telling us as a church that it is our job primarily to take care of the vulnerable. It is not the government's job. That's why every time you see the government doing something like this, they fail at it horribly because it's our job and we failed at it so they had to do it. You know, it's time for us as a church to not only fight for those that are unborn but also to fight for those that are born that need us. And I'm not sure we can do one without the other because it's hypocrisy. If we're gonna say that we support life, then we gotta look at this idea that it is the rescue mission of the church to speak into the life of these vulnerable people across the globe. In fact, in the book of Matthew, Jesus is speaking to the crowds. It's his last message to the crowds as a whole, not to the disciples, but to the massive crowds. And Jesus describes to them what the end time is gonna look like for people when he returns. He describes to them what the litmus test of his separating is gonna be. And let me just read over to you really fast how all this connects. Matthew 25, verse 31 says this, when the son of man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne and all the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats he will put the sheep on his right hand and the goats on his left you're going to want to be a sheep by the way watch verse 34 then the king will say to those on his right that's the sheep you who are blessed by my father take your inheritance the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world watch verse 35 it ties it together for I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then verse 37, then the righteous, that's us, right? Those that know him will answer him and say this, Lord, when did we see you hungry? and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing of clothes and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison? And when did we go to visit you? You may wanna underline this next verse. Then the king, Jesus, will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. 
You see how the pieces come together? Do you realize that every single action that we take on behalf of Christ in the life of a vulnerable person, we are literally doing it for King Jesus. For King Jesus. And and look, I know some of you are like, well, Matt, this text is not, it does not specifically say kids. No, but implicitly it includes them for sure. So what is Jesus saying to us? He's saying, listen, your sympathy is not enough. Sympathy is just realizing or having these feelings of pity, right? We're really good at that. It's like the Sarah McLaughlin, like little deals online, save the pets. I mean, we're, we feel bad about it. He's also saying, listen, your, your empathy is not enough. Man, we can empathize, can't we? Oh man, I know how you feel. I stubbed my toe one day. I know you just lost somebody. No, no. He's saying your empathy is not enough. What is Jesus saying? Here's the principle. Jesus says this. It's compassion that leads us to action. It's compassion. You see, compassion is this feeling of not all, I'm sorry. Compassion is this idea of I see that and I am gonna take action in this to try my best with whatever means that I have to make it right. That's compassion. And here's the deal. Can I just tell you that's exactly what Jesus did for you when you were orphaned. When you were not a son of the king, when you were not a daughter of the king, when you needed rescuing, it was not the empathy of Christ and it was not the sympathy of Christ. It was the compassion of Christ that reached down and delivered you and made you his family. In fact, Romans 8, 15 says this. The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. And put the pieces together for us just for a minute and say this. If this is what Christ has done for us, it is now what he is asking us to do for others. Here's the question, what are we doing? What are we doing to show our compassion to the fatherless? What are we doing as a church to live this out? What are we doing as a body of believers to live this out? And here's the second one, what are you doing? What are you doing? Do you know there's 153 million orphans in this world? 153 million. Did you know in the, state, in the United States alone, there's 437,000 foster kids available to be taken into a home for a little while? Did you know there's over 115,000 kids that are ready to be adopted tomorrow? 115,000. Here's the deal, I know that not every single one of us are called to be on the front lines of this ministry. I get that. I would never assume that. But let me just say this, every believer is called to be in the line somewhere. Somewhere in the line of pure and faultless religion. How in the world can we look at the adoption of Christ that he gave us and not yet turn around and live that out in the life of someone else. I want you to do something a little bit different as we close this morning. I know it's a little bit of an un, uh, a little bit of a different kind of service. I want you to close your Bibles. I want you to close your notes. I want you to shut down Angry Birds. And I just want you to look at me for a minute. I'm I'm fully aware that it's not my job to talk you into anything. It's not. I'm. I'm nowhere near that good. But I'm also fully aware that the Holy Spirit speaks in still small voices that are mighty, that are mighty. So this morning, I want you to open your heart up just for a few minutes this morning and I want you to ask yourself four questions. And not only do I want you to ask yourself these four questions, I want you to, in a spirit of prayer, because you can talk to yourself and talk to God at the same time. It's okay. I want you to ask God to do a couple of things in your life. And some of these are going to be a little bit scary. I'm not going to lie. 
So I just want you to do something this morning. I know this is a little weird. It's not how we normally do things, but that's okay. I just want you to bow your heads where you're at. I want you to quit worrying about where we are or what's going on next. I just want you to pray these four prayers. Here's number one. I want you to pray, God, would you point out the places in my personal purity that I need to offer up to you? God, just point out those spots that I need to give you. Can I just tell you that he already knows them? You're not hiding them from him. But your healing doesn't start until you allow him to hear you say, here it is, Lord. God, point out those places in my personal purity. That's where pure religion starts. Number two, I want you to pray this. God, give me a personal sense of responsibility to serve the vulnerable. A personal sense. Not one of these, hey God, help those out that can do this. No, no, no. God, give me a personal calling to serve the vulnerable. Maybe for you, that's gonna be here at Burn Hickory serving in one of the ministries that serves them. Maybe it's coming behind the one team. Maybe for you, it's joining up with like Calvary Children's Home once a month or once a week. Or maybe it's for you joining in with Must Ministry. Maybe for you, your personal sense is to join that next trip to Kenya or when we jump into Guatemala or one of our partners. God, give me a personal sense of responsibility to serve the vulnerable. Here's number three. So it gets a little bit personal. God, show my family if or how you're leading us to even consider starting the process of rescuing a child. God, show my family if and how we can even start this process. Maybe for you, it's just to attend one of the meetings on what it looks like to be a foster parent. Maybe for you, it's what it looks like to be an adoptive parent. Maybe for you, it's what it looks like to be part of a respite team or a support team, whether that's financially giving to the Lifesong Fund to launch those that need it. Maybe for you, it's just like, I'm not really sure where my heart is, but I wanna do something. God, show me, show my family, all of us, God, what that looks like. Here's the last prayer. God, show this church how to speak up for those who can't speak for themselves. God, just show us how to step into ministries like the one we just talked about with Peter, the ones that are here in our community, the families that need us around the world or in our backyard, how we can rise up for the fatherless. God, show us. so many, God, opportunities for us. God, I pray that today we can take home the worship guide. We can read through the info in there, whether it's bringing socks or underwear or giving to the Life Song Fund here at this church to fund adoptions or literally beginning the process of saying, hey, my home needs to be a place just like the one that stepped into Gabe's life to give him stability to give him hope, to introduce him to who Jesus is. Lord, I don't know how you're gonna move after this week, but I know one thing, this church is gonna chase after the vulnerable. And we're gonna be a lighthouse for you here in whatever that looks like, Jesus. Thank you today that we celebrate. And God, oh, what a day it would be if more of us saw into the lives of those who have no one. God, we would change the world. Thank you, Jesus, for meeting with us. And it's in your holy, holy name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Bless you guys. We'll see you next week in the missions area. There's some people from one ministry. There's some others in the back. Y'all have a great week. Bye.